The readings for the Solemnity of St. Pius X, the readings taken from his feast day, September 3rd. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Brethren, we had confidence in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God in much carefulness, for our exhortation was not of error, nor of uncleanness, nor in deceit. But as we were approved by God that the gospel should be committed to us, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who proveth our hearts. For neither have we used at any time the speech of flattery, as you know, nor taken occasion of covetousness, God is witness, nor sought we glory of men, neither of you nor of others, whereas we might have been burdensome to you as the apostles of Christ, but we became little ones in the midst of you, as if a nurse should cherish her children. So desirous of you, we would gladly impart unto you not only the gospel of God, but also our own souls, because you are become most dear to us. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is taken from St. John, chapter 21. At that time, Jesus said, saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? He said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith to him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? He saith to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he had said to him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And he said to him, Feed my sheep. Please be seated. Dear servers, dear faithful, there are a couple of announcements for this Sunday. First of all, that there will be a bake sale today after Mass. So please, if you have bake sale items, please make certain that they're ready to be sold after Mass. And then, of course, all of you, I hope, will pay, pay notice and buy up all of the bake sale items. A couple of announcements for Requiem Masses coming up. First of all, Paula Bradley, many of you know her. She had moved to Oregon, but then she passed away recently. And her funeral will be this Saturday, September 11th. Please check the bulletin for the details, for normally there will be the wait held before the Mass. So 9 a.m., you can come here to attend the wake and say the rosary, and then the Mass will be at 10 a.m. We also want to pray for the repose of the soul of Douglas Weekly. Many of us knew him for many years here, a great asset to the parish and his great work that he would do tirelessly to help out with things. And slowly that waned as he got more sick, became more sick, but still God will bless him for his efforts done for the church. His funeral will be the following week and more details will be coming in the bulletin. So please watch the bulletin details, and hopefully I can announce this in due time. Another sad event happened yesterday early morning, and that was the loss of, this, of our priest, Father Bormo. Father Bormo died in Kansas City after 33 days of struggling to live. He had been critical, then became better, and then finally succumbed to these complications after contracting COVID. Father Bormeau was 40 years ordained. Since his ordination, he had spent his 40 years serving the Society of St. Pius X faithfully, a noble soul, a noble priest. He had taught at the seminaries, especially ours in Winona, and then also in Ridgefield. 
He has been in charge of the priest program, training of priests coming over from the Novus Ordo liturgy. He had been doing that for quite a few years. And he also <clears throat> authored the book, The Hundred Years of Modernism, which many of you may have seen already in our bookstores or otherwise. A very good book, a very Bermo book, because he was very intellectual, very philosophical, and he loved to do these writings. So I ask you to pray for his soul, for certainly it is a loss. We never like to lose a society priest. We have too few anyway. And he was just newly assigned to be the prior there in Kansas City. And Father Moshe was going to be the pastor of the parish. So I guess Father Moshe will have a little more responsibility for now. Yes, we don't know yet when the funeral arrangements will be, but I certainly would hope that you pray for him nonetheless in your rosaries. Also, I'm going to, depending on the finishing of Mass, I hope to hear 30 minutes of confessions after Mass, so many of you can get in, that's to say about 10 of you. So if there's 10 of you who would like or need to go to confession this Sunday, you may talk to the ushers, they'll take note of who these 10 are, and I have time to hear those 10 confessions before I go to San Diego. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Dear faithful, I certainly appreciate Father Pauli and Father Dreher covering for me when I was away to take a short vacation and then to preach the retreat in Post Falls, where 31, 30, close to 34 men were on this retreat, an Ignatian retreat, at a retreat house that we use not far from the parish of the Immaculate Conception. A well-received retreat, and I had to emphasize to them to be men of valor, men of fighting, men of principle, men not running out of fear in this life, but men dedicated to our Lord. The Ignatian Exercises is bent, made, that men may become soldiers, not military soldiers, but following the spirit of St. Ignatius to be spiritual soldiers. We need them in this life. You know, when it came down to it, as we moved through the exercises, and I saw these men were really taking in the retreat well, I hope they continue to be generous, but I can see a certain generosity in them which allows me to push them. And to push means that they look at their lives as men, as Catholics, as leaders, never forgetting that they're a husband to their wife, that they're there to sanctify their families. That is the purpose of a man in his home, to make his home and his family holy. Nobody else is going to do it. I try, but I'm a satellite. I'm not in the home. I tell you what to do in the pulpit and from the instructions, and who's going to carry it out? Who's going to carry the orders from the pulpit and the altar to the home? It's the Father. The Father must sanctify himself, and he must sanctify his home. He must make his home holy. Make it like a Bethany. Make it a place that persons want to be. And that's the real balance in this world, isn't it? When all of the things around us say that women should divorce their husbands and children should divorce their parents, 
It's a real balance to keep because everybody wants to reject the authority of the Father. Then he gives up. He doesn't want to sanctify himself. For what use? He doesn't want to sanctify them, Ingrid's that they are. It's a real balance to keep. You've got to keep doing your duty even if people reject. You have to keep doing your duty, even if somebody says, <laughs> I don't care what you say. So important. And on this solemnity of St. Pius X, we find a true father, a father of a family, the family we call the church, which needs a father to rule and guide. To love, to put order and discipline. And that's just what Pius X did. At his time, he fought to do so many good things for the church, regardless of human respect. And he's a man for our age. The things that he fought for, the things that he was able to accomplish, I say, even in his time, didn't see their full fruition. He did a lot, and a lot was accomplished for the good of the church, even to push back modernism, which went underground and came back up. The evil serpent came back up. The Vatican II, even a little bit before. But he still tried. He still bear, bore, by his good works, many good fruits. But still, the fruition of his works is still not fully accomplished. And where is it being accomplished today? But in your homes. In these parishes of tradition. That's where it's being accomplished. He is a man for our time. He is a patron saint for our time. And I'm so happy. We are so overjoyed. That by the wisdom of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, he chose Pius X, Saint Pope Pius X, to be our patron. Pope St. Pius X, whose name previously was Joseph Sarto, was born in a village called Riese in the Venetian province. He enrolled among the students in the seminary of Padua, and when he had been ordained priest, was first a curate in the town of Tombolo, then pastor at Salzano, then canon and chancellor of the bishop's curia at Treviso. He was so outstanding in the holiness that Pope Leo XIII made him bishop of the Church of Mantua. Lacking in nothing that makes a good pastor, he labored particularly to teach young men called to the priesthood. He fostered the beauty of divine worship and the growth of devout associations. He saw that the needs of the poor with generous, generous charity. And because of his great merits, he was made a cardinal and created patriarch of Venice. After the death of Pope Leo XIII, he took up the supreme pontificate like a cross having refused it in vain. And we read about this in the stories of Cardinal Mary de Vall, the secretary to the Pope. He said he found him crying after he was, a, he was elected, before he had accepted, before he was crowned. He realized the gravity, and that's why it was a cross to him. And he didn't, he didn't refuse it. He refused in vain. But seeing the will of God, he accepted. And placed upon the chair of Peter, he gave up nothing of his former way of life. He shone especially in humility, simplicity, and poverty. He ruled the church firmly and adorned it with brilliant teachings. As a most vigilant guardian of the faith, he condemned and suppressed modernism. You know this as Pescendi. The sum of all heresies, as a most zealous defender, of the freedom of the church. He boldly resisted those who strove to bring about her downfall. He provided for the sound education of clerics, brought the laws of the church together into one body, the reform of canon law, and greatly fostered the cult and more frequent reception of the Eucharist. You know him as the Pope of the Eucharist, Pope of Holy Communion, lowering the age so little children could go to communion. Worn out with his labors and overcome with grief at the European war, 
we also know it as World War I, which had just begun, he went to the Heavenly Homeland on August 20th in the year 1914. And it was Pope Pius XII who numbered him among the saints. Pope Pius XII canonized him. As I say, dear faithful, you can see by the biography, you can see by his life, his example, that he is a man for our times. If we were not celebrating this solemnity today, it would be the Mass of the 15th Sunday of Pentecost, and the Gospel is that of the widow of Naim, traveling out with her son who had died. He was on the stretcher, being carried out to be buried, and our Lord saw her weeping. And he had compassion on her. And he told the young man to stand, rise. And he did, and he was healed. And St. Augustine tells us that this is like the church. You see, our Lord, when he heals the young man, he healed this young man who had died, who was visibly dead, physically dead, and there were tears surrounding that. The same Augustine says, Holy Mother Church rejoices, for in the first instance, a young man was dead physically. But all of us, these latter, were dead souls. The one was dead visibly, and there were visible tears, but no one could know of the invisible death of all of those souls that would need to be brought into the church. No one was concerned about them. Christ, however, knew their condition and went forth to seek them. Their death was known only to him who had the power to make them live again. And so he, through the church, enlivens, resurrects so many souls. So I hope you understand, dear faithful, what the enemy's agenda is, whether it be Satan on down through his minions. He, they, the enemies, want to ruin the church which St. Pius X protected. They want to ruin it because so many souls could be saved and go to heaven. It is the vehicle, it is the means, it's the way, it's the gate that leads to our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, if we want to know how it is that we allow this to happen, all we have to do is look at the epistle from the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. We're told by St. Paul. We're told what we need to do to avoid these downfalls. But he also is, in a way, rebuking us. Because he says, brethren, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not be made desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Bear ye one another's burdens. And so you shall fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be something, whereas he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And let everyone prove his own work, so that he shall glory in himself only and not in another. Everyone shall bear his own burden. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. He that soweth in the flesh, in the flesh he shall, show, he shall reap corruption. If he sows that way, He's going to reap that way. So he says, while we have time, let us work it good to all men, especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Where are we going to work the first good? In the household of the faith. We have to help our fellow Catholics. We don't want them wandering away down the rough road to hell, losing their souls. But I don't know if there's many who really care about that anymore. Because we're all saved. Do you see how nice that is? Change the philosophy. Change the theology. Say everybody's saved. That's very nice. No effort needed. Then where is everybody headed? Down the nice, slippery, padded road to hell. I told the men on retreat that we must meditate upon hell at least once a month because hell feared 
keeps our passions scared. Hell feared keeps our passions scared. It's a reality. It's a delineation. It's a guardrail to keep us from falling into the abyss. Look at this pontiff, Pius X. Look at his work. Look how it ate him up. And he died with a broken heart, it is said. Again, you can read Mary Duvall, Cardinal Mary Duvall on this issue. He was at pains to keep the peace in the world at world, the time of World War I. But he saw it as inevitable because men were selfish. Men are materialistic. Men hate each other. And perhaps they hate God too. I know today they do. But even at that time. And the only answer is really the church, our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace, the sacraments that come through, the grace that comes from the sacraments. Today in the gospel of this feast day of St. Pius X is a beautiful one. It should be one of our favorite. Peter, lovest thou me? And I leave you with this idea, these thoughts, dear faithful. What was it that helped St. Pius X be a true father for the church? What was it that even turned St. Peter around? Love. Although imperfect, Peter's love was very imperfect at first. You don't know this so much from the English, but in the Latin and in the Greek, our Lord first asked him if he loved him with a supernatural friendship. Diligo. D-I-L-I-G-O. Diligo. Peter missed that part because he responds, yes, I love you. He responded like I'd love a friend who's a buddy at the bar. That's what he knew. And our Lord asks again. And he responds again the same way. Until the third time he does the same. And our Lord asks him that very last time the same as he had responded. Our Lord couldn't get much more out of him. Not then. And it would take his whole life, Peter's whole life, to prove the diligo, to prove the true love which he would have to show by hanging upside down on a cross. If that's what it takes to love Jesus perfectly, so be it. We're the hard-headed, the hard-hearted. Our Lord knows what's best for us. He knows what we need to be able to love him perfectly, to be able to raise up from the almas to the diligo, from the base love to a friendship. It took Peter a long time. He's a good man. We even say he's Saint Peter. And he was powerful. But he wasn't perfect. But he came, became perfect. And he became perfect through his duty as Pope. By laying down his life for his friends. We know of that scene. He was headed out of Rome. And our Lord went the other way, passed him in a vision, and he said, Lord, wait a minute, where are you going? I'm going back to take your place. No, not that again, he said. And he went back and he died as Pope. What about us? How are we proving our Lord that we love him threefold, even if we're imperfect? We're imperfect in our love of God. I can tell you that. And we will only be perfect in our love of God when we allow him to guide us, purify us, and nail us to the cross. Scary words for a lot of Catholics. But that's what separates the true Catholic from he who only bears the name. So think about these readings, whether the 15th Sunday or the readings of this Sunday, of the Solemnity of Pius X, very powerful for our consideration. We have all the instruction there for ourselves.
And of course, you need to continue the nourishment of your souls and getting to know Pius X and all of his work. So keep studying, keep reading. One good way to do that, to keep yourselves up on your studies, is just to read the Angelus magazine that comes out, or to read your catechism, or to read the life of Pius X. These things help us to hold on and to really be able to say, I love you with a true friendship. So let us pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary, who we invoked at the beginning of this sermon with the Hail Mary. We are in her month of sorrows, in this month of September. She has many graces in store for us. I know she did in the year when the Twin Towers were bombed. Yes, September 11th. Right after her birthday, September 9th, before the exaltation of the Holy Cross, September 14th, and before her feast day, September 15th. A powerful month so many years ago when all this took place. What about this month? I know there are many deadlines for us this month, aren't there? Some will have to have the vaccine. Some will have to wear a mask until next January when you're supposed to have been relieved of them already. What else is going to happen in this month of September? A month dedicated to Our Lady of Sorrows, dedicated to the Holy Cross. Consider ourselves blessed that we're on the right side of the fence and that you remain there. Don't give in to compromise. When one doesn't compromise, it brings suffering. If you're going to stand with Jesus on the cross and Our Lady at the foot of the cross, be ready. It's not easy, but you'll be full of grace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Credo in unum Deum, Patrum omnipotentum factorum celi et terre, visibilium omnium fin visibilium, et in unum Domini Iesum Christum filium Deum in genitum, et ex patri notum antium nia siculam, 